Thank you. Yes, thank you very much uh, for coming. Uh, as you can see, this is a joint work with Matthias Paz and Rosalie Imhoff. Yes, and these are the people. <laughs> and uh, Matthias, uh, it's a public photo. I took it from his website. It's not a private photo. <laughs> yeah. OK, so I'm going to start easy and uh, going to talk about intuitionistic logic. Since this is a philosophy department, I'm going to talk about philosophy of intuitionism uh, and then motivation of this research. Uh, how we got interested in this logic uh, in the uh, logic in between, because the logics that we are interested in are uh, between intuitionistic logic and classical logic, so the intermediate or superintuitionistic logics. Then I'm going to uh, go to logic of quantifier shifts, the one that we are interested in, um, and in the second section in two, we are going to investigate it via semantics, uh, via its cryptic frames. And if we have time, I would also like to go to the third part, which is the proof theory. But if not, the goal is going to cover the semantic of uh, the logic of quantifier shifts. So basically, I would be happy even I go to 27, this slide 27. Yes, so I have only two slides on intuitionistic logic, uh, this is, and it's going to be very general about the philosophy. Uh, maybe you're all familiar with intuitionism and uh, constructivism. Uh, intuitionism is one of the main, uh, along with uh, formalism and uh, Platonism, is one of the main viewpoints uh, to uh, look at mathematics and mathematical objects. And sorry, the slide is very dense. Uh, intuitionism is the view that says mathematics and mathematical objects, mathematical truths, are creations of the human mind. And uh, Brouwer, who was a logician, a mathematician, um, one of the founders of, uh, or the main founder of intuitionism, uh, his program was to rebuild mathematics only using intuitionistic uh, principles, only using intuitionistic methods. He would think that uh, if we have a proof that something exists, then uh, that existence, because it's constructive, we can only think about the constructive part of mathematics. Uh, so this is intuitionism. What about logic? Because we are interested in logic. What is the difference between classical logic and intuitionistic logic? And please do interrupt me whenever you have a question. Uh, so classical logic, uh, as we know, propositional formulas, they have truth values, true or false. And this is the law of excluded middle because it's, it, it excludes uh, any other value other than true or false, right? But in intuitionistic logic, this law is not accepted. Uh, propositional formulas, they don't have uh, a definite truth value assigned to them. Uh, they are considered true whenever you can have an evidence for the truth of them. Uh, by evidence, I mean a proof. Um, so the things that are uh, considered non-constructive are, for instance, proof by contradiction. What do I mean uh, in classical mathematics when you want to prove something, when one of the proofs, one of uh, the ways of uh, proving something is that you assume the negation of it, and then you reach contradiction and then say, okay, so I can, uh, my assumption was false, so I can have, uh, the formula itself. I can. I have a proof for the formula itself. This is not uh, constructively acceptable by mm, constructivism, constructivist or intuitionist. As I mentioned, the law of excluded middle is not accepted, and the double negation elimination, which means that from negation negation of a formula, we can uh, derive the formula itself. Uh, Intuitionistic logic and intuitionism at the beginning, uh, there were many disputes between mainly Brouwer and um, Heiting, uh, and uh, Hilbert, sorry. And maybe you could say they fight, <laughs> they fought over it. But uh, nowadays it's very important and it has uh, found its use in mathematics. Uh, 
um, for instance, in proof assistance, such as ACT or COIC. So if you have a constructive proof, you if you have a proof, it means that you have a constructive proof, and it means that you can use this constructive proof as an algorithm to show that something exists, that object exists. Um, and I'm not going into the interpretation, but um, if you think about logic, you want to uh, see what the connectives and quantifiers mean in this logic. Uh, the most common one is the brower heighting kolmogorov interpretation of connectives and quantifiers. And it's um, like, yeah, so for instance, um, if you have a if you want to have a proof of a and b a conjunction with b then you this proof consists of a proof of a and a proof of b something like this for other connectives as well for this junction a proof of a or b is a proof either for a or a proof for b but with an evidence to see which one is proved and so on and um, if um, you have seen intuitionistic logic or intuitions and for the first time, this is one of the famous uh, examples that uh, people give when they're talking about intuitionism. And because it's short, we can go through it. Uh, so the theorem says that there exists irrational numbers, M and N, such that M to the N is rational. This proof that we are going to go through is mostly not acceptable by constructivists or intuitionists. Uh, how does it go? So we know that uh, square root of two is irrational, okay? So there are two options, either square root of two to the square root of two is rational or not. If it is rational, we are done. M and N are equal to square root of two. But if it is not rational, then I can take square root of two, square root of two as M, and n would be a square root of two, and the result will be rational, will be true. This is not acceptable because you're not giving me the m and n. I don't know which one you're talking about. You know, you have to provide evidence which one is correct. Okay, so let me go. So this was about the intuitionistic logic. Now, scholomization, which is in the title of this talk. Um, let me start with. Uh, a general practice. Suppose that you're proving something and in the middle of the proof, you uh, prove that for all X, there exists Y such that A of X and Y holds. Then you would think that it is convenient to introduce a fresh function, a new function F, such that for each X, pick a Y such that A of X and F of X holds. Uh, Scholomization is defined either in the context of derivability or satisfiability. So the one in the example that I mentioned is the model theoretic view, meaning that uh, we want to replace existential quantifiers by new function symbols. Then at the end, we will get um, a satisfiability, satisfiability equivalent formula. But the proof theoretic view is replacing universal quantifiers, and I'm not showing you how these two uh, definitions are the same, but it can be done. So in the proof theoretic view, I replace universal quantifiers by fresh functions. And then uh, the formula that is obtained is validity equivalent to the formula that we started with. And because um, I am a proof theorist and we are also considering a scholomization for logics in general, I will choose the second one, the proof theory to be. Yes, they need choice function. Yeah, exactly. So the definition of a scholomization, the proof theoretic view. So it's a method to remove strong quantifiers. What do I mean by strong? I mean that um, in the process of pre-nexification, and by pre-nexification, I mean um, bringing out all the quantifiers to the um, at the beginning of the formula. So a formula is pre-nex normal form, then all the quantifiers are at the beginning, and then there is a formula which is quantifier free. So a strong quantifier is the one that after pre it will become universal. 
So for instance, you can think that uh, for all x, a of x implies something. This is not a strong because it's on the left-hand side of the implication. But there exists x, something implies something else. This existential is strong, OK? So uh, positive occurrences of the universal quantifier and negative occurrences of the existential quantifier, which I'm not defining. This is an uh, overview. But it, these occurrences can be defined um, uh, formally. So I want to remove strong quantifiers from a first order formula and replace them with fresh function symbols. So the result, uh, so if I have a formula phi and I do this thing to it, the result is phi to the s. Maybe you can see, right? Yeah, uh, it's phi to the s. And um, the idea goes back to Spolum and it works well in classical logic. Uh, which means uh, classical predicate logics, uh, logic I mean CQC. And um, uh, when first I was thinking about this, it was uh, like this, I thought that because um, classical logic can any form, every formula has a pre next normal form for it, equivalent to this. So this scolumization can be done. I take out all the quantifiers at the beginning and this can be easily scolumized. Uh, and this is my intuition, it, what informally uh, scolumization does in CQC is that it's like that it's blind um, to the place of the strong quantifiers. It looks at the formula, it um, sees where the uh, strong quantifiers are, takes out, removes them, and then uh, substitutes them with uh, fresh function variables. Uh, and we know that in intuitionistic logic, we don't have any, every formula, it's not the case that every formula has a pre next normal form. So you may think that uh, the first impression is that um, scolumization might not be easily done for intuitionistic logic. And that's the case. Um, yeah. So not even for intuitionistic logic, but uh, many intermediate logics, scolumization is a non trivial affair. Okay. Uh, so another definition, uh, because I want to talk about soundness and completeness of a scolumization, I say scolumization is sound and complete for a logic L. If for any formula phi, uh, the logic proves phi if and only if it proves the scolumization of phi. So if we have the this, um, uh, if and only for all the formulas, then we say that the logic L admits a scolumization for all the formulas. Um, and it's a very uh, classic result. It's a very old result by means that for prenex formulas, scolumization is indeed sound and complete in the setting of IQC. Um, but other than that, we don't know much in the setting of IQC, exactly what formulas they have a scolumization. We don't have a characterization. Uh, but there has been many related work in this area. Rosalie and Matthias have done many works uh, in this area, for instance, introducing alternative methods of scolumization. Since this one doesn't work, let's look at other ones, uh, both in IQC and in conservative extensions of IQC. And um, many other people for um, not uh, intuitionistic logic, but substructural logic, fuzzy logic, George and uh, Peter and Matthias, they have done some works on it. Uh, so before I go forward, so I want to say that, um, so I was in the last year in my um, postdoc in Utrea, and I had done some work with Rosalie about interpolation, uniform interpolation, many things about interpolation. And then I thought that, uh, okay, I'm going, so let's use her in a good way to learn new stuff. And then I uh, saw that uh, I knew that she had done some work about scolumization. Uh, I started thinking about scolumization and uh, reading the stuff. Uh, then one thing which came to my mind was about this, um, that any, not every formula has a prenex normal form in intuition and sick logic. And I went to her and I asked her what about, so that's a very natural question. 
that uh, what happens in IQC if uh, I add all the things, I add all the things or I strengthen the logic IQC by some things in a way that uh, every formula can have um, uh, the shift of quantifiers or every formula can have a normal uh, pre-index normal form. And I thought this has been done and this is very uh, obvious, it's the first step. And to my surprise, she said, I don't know, and uh, this hasn't been done. Uh, so that's what I'm going to do here. So what I'm going to do is that to add some axioms to IQC such that the resulting logic will have uh, this property that every formula has a pre next normal form. And then I will ask, does the new logic have a scholemization? Because I have a feeling that if any formula can be uh, written in a pre next normal form, then maybe a scholemization can be done easily. Uh, or if not, for which class of uh, formulas we can do. So this is the motivation of this research, but maybe it's nice also to see an example of the failure of scholemization in IQC. Um, are you familiar with Kripke models for intuitionistic logic? So maybe it will be easier to see after I define the Kripke models. But um, let me just mention that this axiom is the axiom of constant domain. It's called constant domain. And this axiom is not provable in IQC, but it's a scholemization, which means that looking at the strong quantifiers, I see there exists this uh, for all x, a of x. This one is a strong because it's a positive occurrence of a universal quantifier. So I remove this. I um, introduce a new function. In this case, it will be a constant, a of c. So this will be the scholemization of this axiom. This axiom is not provable in IQC, which is in uh, which is shown in this uh, model, but it's a scholarization. It's easy to see that it is provable in IQC. Okay, so any questions for the first part? I think the motivation part is finished. Okay, uh, so let's go to the logic of quantifier shifts. Yes. Just one, one small remark. I mean, uh, that seems to be a new constant. Yes, yes. Yeah, by fresh, I need new. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so I'm in the way of introducing a logic that uh, I want to have a pre next a formula which is uh, in an equivalent pre next normal form for every formula. Uh, so, one of the things that um, make this process hard is that quantifiers and connectives do not commute freely uh, in intuitionistic logic. Uh, what do I mean commute? So for instance, look at the constant domain. I mean that for all x goes inside to the disjunction. This is the commutation of uh, quantifiers and connectives. And uh, from all the possibilities for uh, shifting or commuting the quantifiers and connectives, all of them are provable in IQC, except for these three. The first one is constant domain that we saw in the previous slide. And it says that for all X, if I have A of X or B, then I will have for all X, A of X or B. The next one is the quantifier switch. This is our name. Uh, the quantifier switch axiom, which says uh, for all x, a of x implies b, then there exists x that a of x implies b. And the existential distribution, again, our name, uh, you can, you may suggest better names. Uh, it's if I have b implies there exists x, a of x, then I will have there exists x, b implies a of x. And a and b are first order formulas. And B does not have X free in it. Okay. So as I mentioned, these formulas are not provable in IQC, but in the classical predicate logic CQC, uh, all these formulas and their converses, they are provable. So what I do is that I take all the axioms 
all the quantifier shift axioms, which are not provable in IQC, and add them as axioms to IQC. So this is my new logic. IQC plus these three axioms, and I denote it by QFS, the logic of quantifier shifts. Okay. Okay, now we can talk about uh, Kripke frames and models. It's going to be, uh, we are talking about the intuition seek predicate logic. So a Kripke frame is a triple W, uh, some relation uh, less than or equal to, sometimes they denote it also by R, and a function D. So this W is the set of worlds, it's not empty. And uh, the relation less than or equal to is a binary reflexive and transitive uh, relation over the worlds. And D is a function such that it assigns to each world W in the big W that we have a non-empty set domain of this W. And it has this property such that if a world is below the other one, the domain is contained in the domain of the bigger one. So this is a Kripke frame for IQC. A Kripke model is uh, affordable, a uh, quadruple, such that the first three are form a Kripke frame. And the last one, V, is evaluation function. I say in the usual sense, but we can see also here that we can define the uh, forcing relation, this, this thing that you can see here, by induction on the structure of formulas. Uh, so I say that in a model M, I define the forcing in a model in each world of the model. In a model V, in, in the world, uh, in a model M and in the world V, uh, in all the worlds, top is true, bottom is never true. And uh, the proposition V is validated if and only if V is in that function, V of P. So this, um, valuation function V assigns to each proposition in which words this uh, P, uh, small p is true. Conjunction is as you uh, expect is uh, it's true, A and B is true in a world if A is true there and B is true there, uh, A or B is the same. So, um, but implication is different. It means that, so in a world you have A implies B is true, is true. If for any world above this V, also uh, the V itself, whenever A is true, B should also be true. Uh, existential is um, on the spot. So there exists X, A of X is true in a world when you, when you can find a member of the domain of that world, such that A of D, A of that uh, member is true in V. And the last one is uh, for all, which is a little bit uh, more difficult. And it's, um, so in a world we say that for all X, A of X is true. If you take any world above it and any member of the domain in the worlds above that and see that in each uh, of those worlds, A of that uh, member is true. Could be A and B. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I've, uh, I've not written that. That's a very good question. So um, there are, um, so this V, I am just talking about maybe propositional because I didn't want to uh, have the formal proof. Uh, the V uh, assigns not even to propositional variables, but to each R and to each F, to each relation or function in the language, it assigns something in the domain and then there are the persistency. For instance, if uh, some R of something is true in the world, then it should be also true in the above world. Yeah. So really, if that's it. Yes, yes, and also it, we need that, so this D function, uh, the domain, we also add to the language new constants for each member of the domain D to the language of each world. Yeah. So it's very complicated, but I all, only wanted to show you maybe the propositional part or 
Yeah. Okay. That's a very good question. So, uh, yeah. Mainly, I want you to uh, pay attention how for all existential and implication is uh, working uh, because we will see in our models uh, or frames. And uh, two frames are very important for us. Uh, the one is linear, which is as you expect, it means that for any two worlds in the uh, in W, either this one is below the other one or the other way around. And a constant domain, a frame, uh, we say it's constant domain is the do if the domain is constant in every uh, world in the W. So D of W is equal to D of W prime. Okay. Now um, I'm going to talk about the class of frames which are uh, useful for us for the logic of quantifier shifts. So when I uh, encountered this uh, logic, first I thought that maybe I can find some class of Kripke frames uh, and it's nicer to know a logic with its semantics. Uh, so look at this definition, which introduces a very rich class of frames. And these are frames for QFS. So these are uh, three kinds of frames. The first one is that, so the curly F, is a class of Kripke frames uh, of the following form. The first one is linear, constant domain, and finite number of worlds. And uh, it doesn't matter the domain is finite or infinite. The second um, form of class, uh, the second um, class of Kripke frames is linear, constant domain, and infinite number of worlds. But the domain should be finite. And the last one is we don't have linearity here. We have constant domain. And with the condition that the domain of all the worlds should be and should have exactly one element. OK? So this is our curly F uh, class of group key frames. But also uh, define F sub SW, which will be a class of group key frames for the switch. Uh, but so taking all the Kripke frames that we have by adding linear constant domain and conversely well-founded frames. And similarly for F sub ED uh, by adding linear constant domain and well-founded. And by well-founded, I mean a set is well-founded if any non-empty subset of it has a minimum. And conversely well-founded is having maximum. So these three these three kinds of frames. Mm -hmm. So you have the to be a bunch of three. Yeah. And then on top of that, you are all the linear system you have to work with yeah, but um, the most important part is linear constant domain is always there except for the third one. And then for switch, we have conversely well founded. For ED, we have well founded. Yep. And then we get the nice result. That, so I've uh, written the axioms here in gray so that maybe you, can, you want to look at them. So the theorem is that um, for any Kripke frame F, F validates our logic QFS if and only if F is one of the frames that we saw. And similarly, by the, as the name suggests, F um, validates IQC plus CDM switch if and only if F is in F switch and similarly for ED. Okay. So uh, I think we have time. I want to show you one of them. So for instance, F ED, and this is the one uh, linear constant domain as you can see. So uh, I have many, infinitely many worlds. I have constant domain, domain, the domain of each world is D there. And I want to see what, uh, I want to show you that, uh, so as one, uh, as one part of the proof of the theorem in the previous slide is that this kind of frame is a frame of ED, validates ED, okay? So it's enough to show in the world W in the root. 
So this is well founded, right? Infinitely many uh, words, well founded. And what I have to do is that it's implication, right? I have to show that if in any world above W, including itself, if the antecedent is validated, then the succedent of the implication is true, right? So uh, suppose uh, the antecedent is true in W, right? I'm thinking of maybe writing it or... So I'm going to hand wave, but if it turns out to be difficult to follow, just tell me to write it down. So I'm supposing that W validates B implies there exists X, A of X, right? So there are two options. It means uh, one option is that never in any world above W, B is true. So nowhere B is true, or at least in some world B is true. For the first case, case, when never B is true, it doesn't matter which uh, I want to have the right part uh, to prove the right part. So I have to find an X in the domain. The domain is always the same. I have to find a small D such that B implies A of that D is true in W. Okay, I just choose one D. Um, uh, I mean, it doesn't matter what D I choose. I choose one, and because B is never true, this is this holds, right? But the interesting part is when B is true at some world. So at some world, B is true. But since the this uh, frame is well-founded, it means that there exists a smallest, a minimum world that B is true in that, right? I go to that world. And since I have B implies there exists X A of X, it means that whenever B is true, there exists some uh, element of the domain that A of that element is true, right? I mean, this minimum point, I choose that element. I take it, let's say it's D. And I say that that D works here. Why? Because I, want to I have to show that for any world above W, B implies A of that D holds. Below that node, B, B never holds, so A of D is true. And above, whenever you have something, you, ha you prove something, it is persistent. You have it always. So B is true and A of D is true. And similarly for F switch, but we need the maximum here. It's, it's very similar, but a little bit more difficult maybe. Yeah. Okay. Now you saw that uh, a class of nice cryptic frames for the logic of quantifier shifts. And at this point, I was very happy because I thought that I have a very good class. I can know my logic by this class of cryptic frames. Then I proved this interesting result, the very interesting result, which is surprising. But uh, for the theorem, let me first define what uh, completeness frame completeness means. So let's, ha uh, let's have a logic L. We say L is complete with respect to class C of cryptic frames. When if L proves phi, if and only if phi is validated in the class C of cryptic frames. And this means that I didn't mention, but um, a class of cryptic frames validates a formula means uh, every frame in that class validates it. Frame means that every for every valuation that makes a model based on that frame validates phi, and we saw for models how the forcing works. And uh, so you saw this. The logic L we saw uh, we call it frame complete if there exists such a class C of Kripke frames such that L is complete with respect to C. Okay. And what I want to show you is that these logics, all of them are frame incomplete. Uh, QFS, IQC plus CDN switch, IQC plus CDN ED. So those also two uh, weird uh, frames that we added as well. Uh, it's uh, nice to see the proof, I think. So let's go through it. Uh, I'm going to show the proof only for QFS. I want to show that QFS is framing complete. What do I have to do? I have to say that for any class C of Kripke frames, which are class of Kripke frames for QFS, I have to find a formula such that it is validated in the class C, 
but it's not provable in the logic QFS. So this is a violation of the definition uh, before. For any class C, this thing happens. I can find a formula phi that violates the definition. And I claim that this formula, lean or hoop, hoop is the Dutch pronunciation of this thing. Um, it works. So lean is this axiom, linearity, C implies D or D implies C. And this is one element principle, which says that if there exists x a of x, then for all x a of x, okay? I claim that this phi lean or oop uh, works as this phi that I wanted to find, okay? So how do I uh, go on? First, I will show that, um, let's see the first one, the fact about QFS, about the frames that validate QFS. Uh, anything, any frame that validates QFS uh, because we had the constant domain axiom, it should be constant domain. So the frame is constant domain. <coughs> and um, as we saw in the definition of those frames, um, it is either, either linear or the domain is just a singleton. But this, uh, this is uh, the case that when, whenever I have a frame for QFS, and um, either it is not linear, so it has a fork, or the domain is not a singleton, I can uh, find a valuation, I can find a model such that one of those three axioms are violated. This is very easy to show, so I'm not, this is a proof of sketch. The first fact is just giving you this intuition that fork makes it uh, difficult, makes it wrong, makes one of the axioms wrong, and also if the domain is not singleton. So it means that um, any frame, I'm, what I'm saying is that any frame that validates QFS will also validate the axiom scheme lean or it is either linear or one element principle. But this proof, and I can find an instance of this axiom such that it is not provable in QFS. And how do I do that? I find a model for QFS, which is not a model of this formula. And these points together prove that QFS is framing complex. And I'm not going to go through the proof here, but this is the model that is a model of QFS. But in W1, you can check that lean or oop is not um, validated. Yeah, so we had a rich class of group frames for this logic, but unfortunately it was not um, complete. Uh, so after this part, I was uh, wondering whether uh, the, the axioms that we have added, they're uh, efficient or not. So these are the wonderings that or walking around the uh, logics that we have. So I proved that uh, CD and switch together cannot uh, prove ED. And CD and ED together also, they cannot prove switch. So the three of them are needed. Uh, or it means that uh, QFS and I mean, these three logics, they are uh, distinct. But uh, to my surprise, I saw that switch uh, can prove CD. So if you really want it to be efficient, it's enough to add switch and ED. Uh, and ED cannot prove CD. And these two are not at all trivial. These are very difficult to prove, both of them, but the other ones are maybe easier. Okay, so at this point, I'm happy because uh, I have this theorem as uh, we expected before, that for any formula I have a for, uh, for any formula A, there exists a formula B in the pre-next normal form such that in QFS they are uh, equivalent. So it is true that in QFS, I can uh, switch the quantifiers. I can make any formula prenex in an equivalent way. And another interesting fact was the propositional logic. So the propositional logic of QFS, uh, we define it in the following way, that propositional logic of a first order theory, T, 
denoted by PL of T is a set of all propositional formulas that if you substitute first order uh, formulas for them, they become provable. And the theorem is that the propositional logic of QFS is exactly intuitionistic propositional logic, which intuitively what this theorem is uh, telling us is that as we expected the quantifier shifts, because they're talking about quantifiers, right? They're going to a first order thing. They don't change the propositional content of the logic that we started with, right? So adding them to IQC does not change the base proposition on logic. Oh, okay, uh, so after this, I was thinking, uh, so what about other axioms that they don't hold in IQC? Uh, for instance, this uh, double negation shift axiom, which is not provable in IQC, for all x negation, negation a of x implies negation, negation for all x a of x. Uh, and then it um, turned out that QFS indeed proves it. And this means that um, using a very classic um, theorem for IQC plus double negation shift, I can have this theorem that's QFS proves negation negation of a formula if and only if in the classical logic we have the formula. And some uh, observations also, the switch is very strong. Uh, as we saw, it proved uh, CD. It also proves this double negation shift, but CD and ED together, they cannot prove DNS. And DNS is very weak. It cannot prove CD and even together with CD cannot prove any of those other two. Okay, so I think I have time. I can go to the proof theory part. So any questions so far for the uh, semantics? Okay. Yep. It's, it's a model, it's not a frame. Ah, okay. Yeah. Um, so if you want more uh, clarification, this R is a relation. So the domains are constant. As you can see, I have A and B everywhere, right? The domain are A and B. And uh, I have one relation, R of X. And also I needed um, for the thing that I will have two propositional uh, variables P and Q. So the above words are distinct because the left one proves P and it doesn't prove Q and the other way around for the right one. And as you can see in the above words, R of A and R of B are uh, the same, true. Uh, and so it is not linear as you can see. And it's not one element principle. It has two, this exactly two. And this needed uh, one lemma to show that uh, anything which is provable, if I'm not mistaken, anything which is provable on W3 can be proved in W2 and vice versa. So it needed some kind of uh, middle uh, steps. Uh, okay. Yes, 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 yes. Because the second part, the not being a model of linear group is trivial. Yeah. Yeah, for model of QFS, it's easy to see it's a model of intuitionistic logic. So the other three accents should be checked. And it's enough to check in W1 because the other two words are classical. So mm, the axioms hold there. Yeah. You uh, have a proof for the proof there. The thing. I want to use this one. Uh, this one, okay. Yeah, that. Uh, this one, that's really classic. By a class to these, you mean a class of each class? A class of group of frames, yes. So it means that any model of based on the frames in C is a model of QFS, yes. And then, and then you said that 
whenever you have that class, it's going to be such a value that n is linearly also. So there is basically one containing every word. Yes. yes, 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 yes. And why is that? that whenever you have, uh, I have to, I, I suppose that that falls on the attitude of pure less, you know, uh, either you get linearity or you get. Yes. So it, whenever you have a fork or you have more than one element, you can easily um, find a valuation, make a model such that either switch or uh, the other one is uh, is violated. So, so you have an independent argument. For, for this. Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. But uh, can you go back even further to those classes that you introduced at the beginning? There are the So then, yeah, then you find, right, and then go to the next one. This one? Yeah, that uh -huh. I guess that's big right. So this characterization, okay, now I understand a little bit. So this characterization is basically, I mean, because intuitively you might ask, well, why is that not, not completely different? Yeah, yeah. But this class says is. That's a very good question. Yeah, I've heard this question before. So First, you see this and you expect frame yeah, completeness. Exactly. But the problem is with the definition of completeness, yeah. which goes to the definition of model, because in the definition of L proves phi, we have for every model L, M, such as it's a model of L, it's a model of phi. Uh, and for not having that, I have to find a model, a model, there exists a model. So, you know, there are right. these four all existent going inside each other. There are five sheets <laughs> in the meta, yeah. <laughs> All right, yeah. Okay. So we can go to the weird proof theory. <laughs> Okay, so uh, let's go back to scolumization because we started with scolumization. And uh, here now, uh, we were stuck because we don't have a proof theory. Um, I mean, a proof theory which has it's a good sequent calculus, for instance, that has cut elimination. And as you saw, we don't have a good semantics. So we were thinking about um, how to prove this polymerization. And Rosalie suggested this that um, if we prove that the prenex fragment of QFS and IQC are the same, then we have proved the uh, scolumization. Right, because remember for prenex fragment of IQC, we had a scolumization. If these two are the same, QFS has for any formula in the logic has a prenex normal form, then we have scolumization for all the formulas. Uh, but um, and the corollary would be that uh, QFS admits a scolumization, but unfortunately it turned out to be wrong. So. This formula. Uh, so I started with CD. I was wondering about this for a long time, and then it was in front of me that I start with CD. I have CD as a uh, axiom which is provable in QFS. I do the shift of the quantifiers, as you can see in the blue one. QFS proves it, but IQC does not prove it. So the prenex fragment is not the same. And then up until this part, I gave a talk in. Um, Tbilisi last year in September, and uh, that was it. That was all the results that we had. And Matthias was in the audience, and after the talk, he came to me and said, yes, it, it can be done. The scolumization is done. We, I know it. And I asked him how. I said, yeah, we have, we have a very nice proof system that um, he thinks that it can be a proof system for our uh, QFS logic. And he was right. So the rest is mainly the part, the uh, works that Matias and Juan Aguirrela, they have introduced uh, a proof system. Uh, the rest is basically introducing their system. Um, their system is a little bit weird. So if you're familiar with um, sequent calculi uh, for first order logics, then 
for the rules for quantifiers, there are some rules, there are some constraints that uh, the eigenvariable should not be free, something like this. And what they do in this paper, in this uh, to introduce this uh, proof system, they um, remove the restrictions on the um, on the eigenvariables, uh, which makes it wrong, right? But they add some other conditions uh, on the proofs so that um, whenever you have a proof that um, satisfies those conditions, those three conditions that they say, then the proof is correct. It only proves the things which are provable in uh, intuitionistic logic or in classical logic if you start with it. But in the middle, if you look at it, it will be wrong. So we don't have local soundness. Uh, and they say in their paper that um, uh, we have global correctness, which means that every lie that has been introduced, it will be uh, cleared in the end of the proof. And we will use their sequence calculus. So I'm not sure how much time I have. Um, I think 10 more minutes is fine. Okay. So uh, quickly I can introduce uh, some stuff which are, related, which are needed. So sequence are expressions of this form, gamma double arrow delta and by this, the interpretation is that uh, the conjunction of the formulas in gamma implies the disjunction of formulas in delta. The polarity that I mentioned at the beginning, the negative occurrence and positive occurrences are defined uh, here very uh, formally by induction, meaning that any formula which is in delta is positive, any formula which is in gamma is uh, negative, and also formulas uh, that uh, implication is important. So if uh, A is positive, uh, then if um, the implication occurs positively, then A occurs negatively and so on. Strong quantifiers I mentioned are positive occurrences of universal quantifiers and negative occurrences of existential quantifiers. So this inference is a quantifier inference, this one. Uh, when the formula in the conclusion has a quantifier. Um, and if uh, we have a strongly quantified formula here, then we say this formula A is a characteristic variable of the inference. So if I introduce for all on the right, this A will be called the characteristic variable. And also I need the definition of a side variable. So let's say I have a proof pi. I say B is a side variable of A in pi. If uh, whenever I have a strong quantifier, meaning that for all on the right-hand side of the implication or there exists on the left-hand side, then this B is a side variable of the characteristic formula A. Okay, and I show it by A is less than B. Uh, so the first order LK, maybe you're familiar with the sequence calculus. These are the four rules for the, um, quantif for the quantifiers. And the constraint is that in this rule, there exists left and for all right, uh, this y should not appear in the conclusion. Otherwise, it's you can uh, derive uh, non-true uh, things. Uh, first order LJ is similarly defined uh, when we restrict all the formulas on the right-hand side to be uh, at most one. And QFS is defined LJ plus these three axioms. And um, so this is the weird definition the weird constraint that um, Matthias and Juan put on the proofs in their system to be correct, to have correct um, proofs. Um, let me show you by examples what they look like. So um, the first one is substitutability, which means that the formula A, this characteristic formula, should not appear in the conclusion. 
Otherwise, if it was allowed to be appear in the conclusion, I would get something A of A implies for all X, A of X, which is not true. So the proof shouldn't end here. There is two other conditions, side variable condition and very weak regularity. Side variable is that um, these Bs, the side, uh, what was it called again? This relation basically is a cyclic. So here I cannot have A is in less than B or B is less than A. We can see that here it is uh, violated. And in the end, I have something like for all X there exists Y implies there exists A for all Y, which is not true. And very weak regularity is the same, which is a little bit uh, more complicated. But having these three conditions on the proofs, then they prove that, okay, so the calculus is called LK plus plus, is that um, I take LK, I forget the constraints on the, um, uh, on the for all right and there exists leg and left. And then I add these uh, three conditions. And then they prove that um, whatever is provable in LK plus plus, it is all already provable in LK. And the uh, theorem, which is nice, I mean, I cite them, but it's easy to see because they didn't have QFS. So it's easy to see that LJ plus plus, if it uh, proves some sequent S, then QFS proves it which means that their proof system is a proof system for our logic. And finally, I, the theorem says that we have a scholomization. How? Uh, by this theorem that the scholomization, if I have a scholomization of a sequent gamma double arrow delta, uh, if the proof is cut free LJ plus plus, then gamma double arrow delta will be drivable in LJ plus plus in a cut free way. And the corollary of this theorem is that QFS admits a scholarization. So as a result of all the things that we learned is that this uh, logic that we uh, investigated, it has a scholarization for all the formulas. And uh, some future work. Uh, for instance, um, this is the... Um, question that Rosalie asked, if uh, we can find sufficiently minimal conditions for a logic so that uh, if we have these conditions, the logic admits a scholarization. And um, if L is a logic between IQC and QFS, does the pre-index fragment of L has a scholarization? Uh, disjunction property and existential property are questions for QFS, we don't know. Um, and also considering other axioms which are not provable in IQC, we can see whether they are provable in QFS or not. And thank you.